it's first of all a great joy to um, welcome Jeffrey Pfeffer as our distinguished lecturer today. Um, Jeffrey is probably um, one of the top five business and management scholars on the planet in terms of whatever metrics you want to use, quantitative, qualitative, reputation, esteem. And his work is wide ranging, but I think which why many of us are here today is very much hearing, of course, one of the big issues is why do major organizations often have seemingly dysfunctional leaders? And why do seemingly dysfunctional leaders so often carry on and blossom like the um, Green Bay tree? As I mentioned, Jeffrey's at Stanford. He has visiting roles at numerous business schools around the world, um, recipient of countless honors, and indeed, obviously, on the um, I'd also like to welcome, we have a distinguished discussant, Paul Kirigiri, who's at Northeastern University. Again, one of the um, most productive scholars, uh, international business, but a specialist on leadership. So that's obviously very salient. Um, and finally, I would like to um, obviously thank Mr. Aubrey Dan, um, the um, um, key donor for the department who's made this series um, very um, so successful and so, so um, um, uh, sorry, my dog barked in the background. That's not supposed to have happened. But just like to say thanks, thanks to Mr. Aubrey Dan for his um, generosity in making this um, possible. And again, um, Aubrey is obviously a, a major philanthropic figure in Canada, again, recipient of numerous honors, including the Order of Canada, and again, um, honorary doctorates. So um, I would like to thank everyone. And um, without any ado, I'll hand you over to Jeffrey. How the format's going to work today is um, Jeffrey will talk, Paula will provide insights as discussant, and then we'll have time for all the audience. Thank you, Jeffrey. Over to you. Thank you. And one of the reasons why I come into Stanford is because at Stanford Studio, we would not have barking dogs or any other kinds of issues that we <laughs> try to do. So that's why I'm here. Um, so I'm, my topic for today is why we don't get the leaders we think, and I would em emphasize the word think we want. It's actually we get the leaders that we do want, but we claim we don't want them. Um, the fatal attraction of narcissism and psychopathy. Um, I wrote a column, I think for Fortune, uh, in 2015, when uh, Donald Trump announced his um, uh, campaign for the presidency the first time, and nobody took him seriously, and I wrote a column for Fortune in which I pointed out that Donald Trump had all the characteristics that we claimed we did not want in leaders, but in fact, we consistently selected for. Uh, it turned out many people then gave me credit for predicting his rise, which I would not at all say I predicted. I'm not a political scientist. I don't try to predict elections. Um, but it was reasonably clear to me that we in the field of organizations and management studies um, tell a story about the leaders and the qualities of leaders that we think um, make people effective leaders and the qualities that we claim to seek in leaders. And that list of qualities bears essentially no resemblance. And I mean, literally no resemblance to the qualities of the leaders we actually observe in the world. And as I wrote in a book, um, you know, Leadership BS, which we'll get to in a second, um, I, I think this has had a, um, a, a very toxic effect on the study of leadership, um, in part because we, it leads to enormous levels of cynicism on the part of uh, our students and uh, both executive and MBA who say, my goodness, I go to these classes and I learn about you know, all the things I'm supposed to be and do. And then I look out in the world and it bears almost no resemblance to what I see. And, uh, and so that leads, I think, to excessive cynicism. And this is in my argument, uh, one of the reasons why I believe the leadership industry, and it is in fact an industry has essentially failed. Um, that's a strong statement, but there's a ton of evidence to back that up. Um, the, the leadership industry is the industry that produces the books and the articles and the seminars and the language and the, well, the, the workshops 
uh, that constitute actually quite a substantial industry. Barbara Kellerman estimates its size at about $50 billion US. Um, so if you were to say, how would might we assess the performance of this leadership industry? You could say, you know, well, leaders affect workplaces. So let's look at workplaces, engagement, job satisfaction. We know leaders affect the workplace. What's going on with engagement and job satisfaction? Let's look at leaders' own career success. How, how are leaders surviving in their jobs? How are leaders um, doing in their jobs? Let's go talk to companies and say, you know, part of the leadership development industry is supposed to give companies the leaders that they need to grow and to fuel their um, fill, fill vacancies so they can promote from within. So you can go to companies and say, you know, do you have sufficient leadership talent? Or you can go to organizational or senior management self-assessment of their leadership development efforts. You're running leadership development programs, rate them. And regardless of what measure you use, any of these, engagement, job satisfaction, career success, survival in the job, availability of leadership talent, uh, organizational or senior management self-assessment, done sometimes, by the way, by the very people who are selling these programs, the leadership industry has failed on all of these measures. The performance is horrendous. And by the way, it's not getting any better. Um, and uh, that is stuff that I review in the book, Leadership BS. The good news is I think the problem may be fixable, but in order to fix it, we're gonna have to think about um, the qualities we want in leaders and how we train people for leadership roles in a very different way in a way that many of my students claim is controversial, that to, that to me, it's all common sense. Uh, this is the book, Leadership BS, in which I go through to make the case that I've just made briefly to you about the data, and I review the data on um, leadership shortage, uh, to turnover among senior leaders, um, declining and awful rates of uh, performance on job satisfaction, employee engagement, et cetera, um, and the self-assessment of leaders. So there's a, a quite extensive evidence to suggest that the leadership industry has failed completely and continues to fail and has failed for decades and nobody seems to care because of course, people continue to hire the industry to do the same things in the same ineffective ways that they've always done them, which makes life of course, interesting. So, I have some recommendations for what we ought to do differently. The first recommendation is to stop chasing inspiration. Much of leadership training, you know, I mean, so you look at what's wrong with Donald Trump or what's wrong with Ted Cruz or what's wrong with uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or many of these people. Um, you know, the, one of the problems is, is that they are not nice people, that's for sure. And uh, we want to tell ourselves, of course, inspiring stories. Um, and uh, so my first recommendation is to stop chasing inspiration. I gave a talk at the Valeric Business School in Belgium a while ago and the their website, I was looking up how to spell Valeric because I was gonna use their name in something. And I, first thing you go when you land on their website is looking for an inspiring management course. I said, that's an interesting word, inspiration. You know, if you look at a medical school, they don't say, are you looking for an inspiring medical school course? You don't look at engineering. Uh, you know, they don't look for inspiration. They look for things that are scientific, evidence-based, well-instructed, uh, sensible, but not inspiring. We seem to be into ins the inspiration business. It's bad business. Australian Graduate School of Management's website notes that the school creates inspirational learning opportunities. What do we know about inspiration? It's a very poor way to accomplish change. It raises motivation, but only for a short time. It creates unrealistic expectations for ourselves and others. We actually know how to accomplish change, measurement, priming, reminders, and incentives. So if I wanted to train people about leaders, which is what I do in my class called the Pass to Power, I do not try to inspire them. Um, and as a matter of fact, if I find I have a class visitor who's too inspirational, we get rid of them and try to bring in someone who's like much more realistic. And we try to get our students to think about the world as it is, rather than the world as some fairy tale world that we want to make up. So that's inspiration is one of the issues. The second recommendation I would argue is that we ought to face the evidence of the facts of what does and does not work in, in, in predicting 
And of course, the dependent variable is very important. And the variable that I want us to focus on is leadership emergence. What kind of qual who, what are the behaviors and qualities that cause people to be picked as leaders, picked by their boards of directors, picked in unstructured work groups by their fellow um, uh, perhaps uh, experimental participants, picked, you know, picked, picked in the military, picked in all kinds of different contexts. Who gets picked as leaders? What are their qualities? And of course, we have a story that we tell ourselves. Uh, Jim Collins in Good to Great said, you know, we need level five leaders who are, of course, modest uh, with a fierce resolve. Um, there's this whole thing, uh, what's your face? Um, Benet Brown and, uh, and a bunch of other people who talk about authenticity. And you can hardly walk through the Stanford Business School without hear, hearing stories of authenticity. And we need to be authentic. We need to be, ah, Bill George, true north. Um, you need to be honest. Uh, that's certainly a good thing. We talk about honesty and telling the truth. We talk about keeping commitments, which seems like a good thing. And then we have, of course, Simon Sinek, who wrote the famous book, Leaders Eat Last. I'm not exactly sure what world Simon Sinek is living in, but it's certainly not the world of CEOs where the ratio between CEO pay and um, frontline executive pay has gone from about 70 to 350. Those leaders are certainly not eating last or eating first, second, third, and fourth. So, um, you know, the problem with all of these things is that they are inconsistent with the data. Narcissism and self-promotion reliably predict career success. People do not need to be authentic to themselves. They need to be authentic to what others need from them. Um, this issue, if you, if you haven't read it, it's one of my favorite Adam Grant columns. It's in the New York Times. The title of the column is, Unless You're Oprah, Be Yourself is Terrible Advice. Um, and he goes to... Uh, the Jim Carrey movie, Liar, Liar, and these other uh, things that say, you know, I mean, the worst curse you can give to your worst enemy is to say to your worst enemy uh, on the next, for the next 48 hours, every word that, come out of, that comes out of your mouth is going to be the truth. Um, there's this wonderful guy whose name I forget who actually tried to do this. And of course, as Adam Graham points out, the world is based upon uh, deception and not telling the truth because you really don't want to tell in this particular case, uh, your babysitter that if your wife left you, you would want to sleep with your babysitter. This is not a good thing to do. Um, we'll talk about keeping commitments in a minute. Um, and for looking, not looking out for one's interests, I would just say for decades, human resource departments in the United States and really around the world have said in their company handbooks and to people when they join the organizations, you are responsible for your career. We are no longer responsible for your career. Uh, we haven't been for years. Um, you need to take responsibility for your career. When your company, your employer says you are responsible for your career, you ought to believe them. And if you're responsible for your career, that means by implication, you are responsible for taking care of yourself. And you need to look out for your own interests because you know, the, the paternal organization is not going to because the paternal organization um, has disappeared. Survey show, believe it or not. I looked this up yesterday. Gallup in 2020, who is the most admired person? Donald Trump in 2020, not in 2016. This is after he did everything that he did, after the fact checking after all the things he did. Most admired man in 2020. Fortune asks, who is the most admired person by fellow CEOs? Jamie Dimon, don't get us started on Jamie Dimon. Elon Musk, the most admired business leader, even though if you were to go back to the qualities that we just talked about, modesty, I don't think so. Authenticity, I don't think so. Honesty, nowhere. Keeping commitments, probably not, but he definitely looks out for his own interests. Maccabee's book, The Productive Narcissist, includes, among other people, Jack Welch, the most admired CEO, now deceased, Steve Jobs, George Soros, et cetera. So the surveys show the data. I'm rooted in the data as opposed to all of this wonderful fiction. So the, the data suggests that the people that we select and by the way, the people that we admire have 
very, very little overlap in their behaviors and in their qualities and in their traits with the people we say we want as leaders. And so what I wanna now do is try to explain this enormous discontinuity between what we say and what we pick for, what we think we want and who we actually honor. And it's pretty simple to do. And that is, if I said to you, who do we actually choose? What are the qualities that we actually choose for? And why do we choose them? Number one, you can go read the work of my Berkeley colleague, Cameron Anderson, or anybody else's work on scholar.google.com and say, what is the effect of displays of confidence? Even if that confidence is unwarranted, even if that confidence bears no resemblance to your actual competence, what how, how does confidence affect, affect your being chosen as a leader or your, if you will, leadership emergence? And we find consistently, even though I think Cameron doesn't want to find this, that displays of confidence reliably predict leadership emergence. And that is because confidence is often taken maybe mistakenly, as a signal of competence. So if you act like you're confident, people believe that you know what you're doing, even if you don't. And people love to be led by competent people. Number two, we are attracted to and tend to choose people who exhibit behaviors that are associated with power and the displays of power. For evolutionary reasons, people want to be close to power. You know, if you want your gene genetic material reproduced, you need to figure out two things, friend or foe, and who's going to win so that you can be close to, uh, mate with the person who's going to win or the group that's going to win. Um, and so therefore, people reliably choose others who signal power through speech or appearance. So to give you a zillion examples, I'll give you only two. Height, this has been studies done not just by organizational or management scholars, it's been done by economists. Height reliably predicts salary. And by the way, reliably predicts leadership emergence. The effects are small, but quite robust. Physical attractiveness reliably predicts uh, who gets chosen into leadership roles. And this is true for both men and women. And the reason is, of course, because to the extent that you're physically attractive, you are more able to get allies and colleagues and supporters and mentors. People, you know, my friend, well, these years ago, uh, Jim Collins used to teach at Stanford Business School. He got fired, which is an interesting story. As he was leaving, he gave me a book called Chimpanzee Politics. And if you read it, you will find that the politics among chimpanzees is not that this different in its manifestations from the politics of the people who have evolved from the chimpanzees, um, the human beings. You know, the, the chest beating, displays of power, et cetera. I mean, we don't do it in quite the same way, but we do it. So signals of power and, and behavior that is associated with power is, uh, attracts people, regardless of, you know, anything else. Success, or the appearance of success. For self-enhancement reasons, people want to be close to and associated with success, and so we flock to organizations that are successful. We flock to people who are successful, almost regardless of what they do. Robert Cialdini and his colleagues call this basking in reflected glory. And the basking reflected glory studies are, are, are classic. Uh, but the idea is we want to be close to and associated with success. And we will engage in all kinds of moral rationalizations and justifications to be close to success. My classic current example, Lindsey Graham, our Senator Lindsey Graham says, never Trumper, never Trump, who oh, Trump's horrible. Trump gets elected president and Lindsey, Lindsey Graham affixes his lips to a part of a Trump's anatomy. And the New York Times asked Lindsey Graham, how did you change? What is the difference? And Lindsey goes on at great length, but the line that I love is basically, I wanna be relevant. If you want to be relevant, you want to attach yourself to people in power so that you can be part of the governance, part of the action, 
And people are willing to forego many things to do that. So people are attracted to that. Therefore, because of these three reasons and a few others, leadership emergence and sometimes even organizational performance is predicted by, positively predicted by, all the things we think we don't want. Narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, psychopathy which is so-called the dark triad. Narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy is called the dark triad. And there's a large literature that shows the relationship between narcissism and leadership emergence, Machiavellianism and leadership emergence, psychopathy and leadership emergence. There have been studies of presidents and you know, that turns out the most psychopathic presidents are actually stay in office longer, or the, the, the people with the highest level of narcissism stay in elected office longer, and they actually outperform some of their other people. So I would ask you, if these traits consistently predict succeeding in interviews, being hired, being promoted, earning more money, staying in your job longer, et cetera, all of which the research evidence suggests, why would you call them dark? It's interesting. Anyway, we can talk about that for the time when we have to talk. So leadership emergence is predicted by these traits that we claim we don't want, which is this huge juxtaposition between what we say we think we want in leaders and what we actually select for. And by the way, these are not single studies. This is not some strange organization in some weird part of the world. This is results of meta-analyses uh, done in many, many contexts, including, by the way, the military. And the reason why we love these traits is because these traits and their associated behaviors correspond in many respects to what we expect to see from charismatic transformational leaders. So if you were to say, what is the definition of a transformational or charismatic leader? We want them to be bold. We want them to be self-confident. We want them to be risk-taking. We want them to be charming. We want them to be strong-willed. We want them to be able to attract others to their side. Go read the definition of narcissism. Go read the definition of Machiavellian. Go read the definition of psychopath. It, the overlap is enormous. So we have a definition of an, and an image and a set of traits that we associate with leaders that actually overlap quite well with the traits associated with the three concepts I've been talking about. Recently, Charles, my colleague Charles O'Reilly and I did a study because he is fascinated by why we, why we pick uh, the people that we do in, or why they emerge in organizations in leadership roles. And we looked at, um, you know, and he said, you know, organizations are political places. Um, Gerald Ferris and many other colleagues have argued that political skill is very important for success in organizational contexts. And I think that's right. And he said, maybe it's possible that narcissists are better politicians. So we did a study in which we found that narcissists are number one, more likely to see organizations in political terms. They're number two, more willing to engage in organizational politics. And three, they're more successful in doing so. <clears throat> so that provides yet another answer as to why they emerge in leadership roles. <coughs> There's a wonderful, article um, written in a, the social psychological journal. The title of the article is Breaking the Rules to Rise to Power. Because of the heuristic association between norm rule violations and power, the powerful get to break the rules. That means violating rules and social conventions increases the perceptions of someone's power. One of the advices, one of the words of advice I gave to many of my friends uh, which of course they didn't take because no one pays attention to the social sciences in politics, is that if you wanted to take down or make Donald Trump less successful and effective, the last thing you would do, the last thing you would do, which is of course the first thing everybody does, is remind people of all the norms and rules that he violates. Because every time you remind people of the norms and rules that he's violating, you signal his power and people are attracted to power, but in any event. People's desire to be close to and associated with power and success causes people to overlook, forget, and forgive many forms of misbehavior. 
Martha Stewart's gone to jail. Her brand has never been worth more. Michael Milken has gone to jail. He was introduced in an Oakland A's baseball game because he was in the broadcast booth as a philanthropist. Um, I could go down the list. Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos fame is out raising money for her next venture. Um, so you can, it, it, it goes on and on and on. We want to be associated with power and therefore we will rationalize away and forgive and forget many forms of misbehavior. The article uh, that demonstrates this is an article actually in marketing. The title of the article is Tip of the Hat, Wag of the Finger. And it's basically an article of how motivated cognition um, our desire to, 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 in their case, since they're marketing people, how you want to select a candidate, how you want to pick a product, and how, if your desire, how your desire to be close to a candidate or to select a product that you want can cause you to rationalize away, overlook, and forget and forgive many sins of the company that makes the product or many sins of the candidate. This leads, and we're moving right along, to two existential questions, which we'll raise because this is a smart group of people and we want to have an interesting discussion. The first existential question is, are these traits, are can behaviors associated with these so-called dark triad be trained and taught? Are these stable and enduring personal traits? I actually believe that behaviors and skills can be taught, taught and learned. So, so narcissism is not a, and displaying confidence, people are not confident. You can teach people to engage in confident behavior. Uh, you can look at um, Amy Cuddy's TED talk uh, where she talks about power posing. Uh, that would be an example. My colleague, Deborah Grunfeld has a talk on YouTube called Acting with Power. You can teach uh, my friend at Berkeley, Dana Carney has written fabulously fantastic, which I highly recommend articles that summarize the, what the findings are in body language, how to show up with power, what the gestures are, the facial expressions, the language you need to use to project power. So these are all behaviors and skills that can be taught and learned. There's no question in my mind about that. Second question, even more existential, should these behaviors be taught given the association of many of them with achieving power and many other indicators of career success. Or as Robert Moses, the famous parks commissioner who basically built most of New York in the 20th century, he's famous for the quote, do the ends justify the means? He said, if the ends don't justify the means, what does? So should these behaviors be taught? My answer to that is yes. It's what I in fact teach in my class called the Pass to Power, which is quite a controversial class. So I did have 145 people on the waiting list for each of my two sections which is, you know, many people believe it needs to be required require class. Some people believe I should be, you know, executed or something, but in any event. So the two existential, existential questions are, can these behaviors be taught and should they be, which is probably even more existential if you uh, think about it. I'm writing a book called The Seven Rules of Power. So I thought since, you know, you were kind enough to ask me to speak to you, I will give you the seven rules. We're not gonna spend very much time talking about the seven rules of power. Uh, the first rule of power is get out of your own way. I think that's the hardest. It's the most fundamental. I think we getting out of your own way means basically losing a bunch of assumptions and self inhibitions and self whatever that says, I can't do this. I won't do this. This is inconsistent with what my mommy or daddy taught me. This is inconsistent with what some leadership guru taught me. Get out of your own way. Um, and, and decide what you're willing to do in order to be powerful. Secondly, break the rules, which we've already alluded to. Rule breaking is necessary. Uh, there's a, if you, a fabulous article. I'm you know, an educator, so I'm trying to give you other things to read besides me. Um, if you have not read it, in the New Yorker in 2009, it's, it's fantastic. Um, uh, um, the article, How David Beats Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. How does David beat Goliath? By breaking the rules. You know, he's not going to put on the armor that Goliath has. He's not going to be able to move. He's going to use the shepherd's tool, the slingshot. And he goes through a number of examples in how David beats Goliath that shows, I mean, how does Lawrence of Arabia win the war by breaking the rules? How does George Washington win the Revolutionary War by breaking the rules? How does a 
girls Palo Alto basketball team over succeed given their natural ability by by playing a full court press 100% of the time. So rule breaking is fundamental. Third, appear powerful. We've already talked about that. Fourth, build a powerful brand. Absolutely. Network relentlessly. Use your power. And the point that we've been making throughout the talk, once you've acquired power success, uh, the means used and will be forgotten, forgiven, or both. So your job is to get power. And once you're there, everybody will kind of forget about what you did to get there. I end with some principles from the prince um, because uh, we're past the 500 years of uh, Machiavelli, who has much to teach us. Uh, my view is, says Machiavelli, that it is desirable to be both loved and feared, but, if it's, but it's difficult to achieve both. And if one of them has to be lacking, it is much safer to be feared than loved. The promise given was a necessity of the past. The word broken is the necessity of the present. This is keeping commitments. Never attempt to win by force, but can be won by deception. It is the most translated work in the Italian language. Francis Bacon thought Machiavelli was a realist undeterred by utopian fantasies. The scholar Isaiah Berlin says Machiavelli helped cause men to become aware of the necessity of making agonizing choices between incompatible alternatives in public and private life. And this is of course my favorite quote from the New York Times by John T. Scott and Robert Zaretsky on the 500th anniversary of the publication of The Prince. Machiavelli teaches um, that in a world where so many are not good, you must learn to be able to not be good. The virtues taught in our secular and religious schools are incompatible with the virtues one must practice to safeguard those very same institutions. The proper aim of a leader is to maintain his state and not incidentally his job. Politics is an arena where following virtue often leads to the ruin of a state, or has pursuing what appears to be vice results in security and well being. In short, there are never easy choices, and prudence consists of knowing how to recognize the hard decisions you face and choosing the less bad as what is the most good. And this is not from Machiavelli, that's from them and their um, edit on the editorial page, op ed page of the New York Times under the title of the article is Why Machiavelli Still Matters. It is, I, and I think this last slide and last uh, quote, I think really sums it up that we, so my answer to the question of why we choose people that are incompatible with what we claim to want is because in our heart of hearts, we understand that if we chose what we claim to want, we would be in bad shape. And that choosing people that are the opposite of what that we claim to one in leaders is actually the most sensible, intelligent, and logical thing for us to do. And it is what we do consistently. We, we do it, by the way, not just in politics, where you can see this all the time, um, but we also do it in business, where many of the business leaders uh, bear almost no resemblance uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, um, to the traits that we say we want in, um, in, in, in leading business leaders. So that is my short, um, and kind of uh, overview of all of this and my answer to the, to, to the question. We ought to pay attention to the evidence, not to these aspirations and inspirations. And we ought to teach our students uh, and we ought to teach ourselves uh, the, the qualities that actually lead to leadership emergence. The, the motto of Stanford Business School is change lives, change organizations, change the world. If you're gonna change lives, change organizations and change the world, you need to be, by definition, it seems to me, in a position of leverage. You need to be in a position of power. Change is never gonna happen unless you get yourself in a position where you have the influence, the resources to drive change. And so that's why I can teach this and why I guess we have you know, all these students on the waiting list also. So it's kind of interesting. Anyway, I am, now done, we're going to stop screen sharing. Thanks, Jeffrey, for a really inspiring talk. Had a lot to think about. Just over to Paula. So, Jeffrey, thank you. That was uh, really so, so thought uh, provoking. When Jeff asked me if I would do this as a discussant, um, the thought of following you was, was moderately terrifying. 
And I said to Jeff, well, you know, I'm a, a cross-cultural, I, I study cross-cultural leadership. And if you, you know, every, if you give someone a hammer, everything looks like a nail. In this case, you know, I, I look at the, this conversation and think, oh gosh, I wonder how much of this is, is global, is applicable around the world and how much of it is very unique to um, an Anglo culture or uh, uh, Western culture, so to speak. So that was sort of the, the first kind of commentary and would be around, I wonder to what extent this, this holds around the world. And I think it's gonna be really interesting because it seems like we have a multicultural uh, audience. I actually wanted to, to share, um, you had cited the, the Maccabee piece and I love that as well. I thought it was really interesting, you know, that range of, you know, that functional narcissism and then that unproductive narcissism and then you move over to the psychopathy, the, the wow. really craziness. And I think most of the people, you know, when, when Trump, as you noted, when Trump uh, started coming on the scene, everyone's like, oh, that's such a narcissist, such a narcissist. And it was the psychologists who were out there saying, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a clinical definition. So maybe we ought maybe we ought not like just sling that out. Um, but to your point, and I think this is so valuable. There is, the, you know, some would say that narcissism is on a spectrum, and we're all on that that spectrum, and that you know some of us kind of bridge over to that unproductive narcissism. But there are those traits of the the productive narcissism. So I think that the things that would be nice to remind us all that, you know, narcissists, <laughs> productive narcissists, they're the ones with the vision. They're the ones that can rally the troops. They're the ones that can get people marching, you know, in a certain direction. They might be not nice people, but you know what? They can move things forward. They're the big visionaries. They have the hubris and the bravado to make things happen um, around the world. They can be inspiring, and I know you don't like the word, but they can inspire and they can charm, um, and they can, in fact, be great communicators. What it reminded me of, and, and I know um, you, the conversation really needs to happen with you, so I'm just going to kind of um, sh share a piece that, that I do in my leadership classes, and that's around the executive presence. It's I'm, I'm a so much softer touch than you are, Jeffrey, I think. So I, I like to couch the, you know, treat, you know, teaching those skills that you absolutely need, but I couch it in the executive presence. So it's that idea of, you know, we need to instill confidence, have credibility. I say not arrogance, it often tilts to arrogance. You want to be admired. You want people to emulate you. You want to have those skills. And these are universal. You know, the research around the world is suggesting that these, these traits are in fact universal having that attractive personality, great communication skills, and knowing how you appear in the eyes of others. All these things sort of roll into that executive presence. And, and these are studies I'm sure you're, you're citing as well, but I love this one about the chief information officers that the number two quality that predicted people who ascended into that CIO role wasn't their technical skills. Number, the second one was their executive presence. So exactly to your point, it's it's not the technical stuff, stuff that gets you there into those leadership roles. It's this stuff we don't teach. Some of us teach it, but but we don't all teach it, right? Um, again, I, I, I just love the, the breakdown of this. Um, so many times when people are, are teaching executive presence, they spend far too much time on look and grooming and, and that pulled together appearance, which is relevant. Um, but it explains about 5% of the variance in executive presence. It's really that other other piece, those skills that you're that you're teaching, that decisive action and the vision and the confidence um, yeah. and communication. So I just I thought those were, were sort of interesting. Um, the example that I, I just I just thought was was great. I don't know Jacinda Hearn from New Zealand. I've never met her. You may have. Um, I don't know if she is where she is on the narcissism spectrum, but I do know that she was able to manage a lot of complexity and do it successfully. You know, and she was reelected. <laughs> so I, you know, in terms of what what's working, what's winning. I just thought, you know, she was a great example. Another terrific example. I'm going to move over 
um, to uh, Gary Ridge from WD40. You know, I, I again, I, I've met Gary a few times. He's a wonderful, wonderful leader. He is known for creating that um, that tribal mentality in his in his company, and that that people are working kind of to make uh, to work collaboratively for the sake of WD40. He's great. He can show humility in that he asks for input. Was he, he's also able to balance that with a tremendous sense of of, um, of confidence and the like. So where I'm going to end, and I'll you know certainly this is this is more your space than mine. I you know no, it's this idea that you know I and maybe I'm a, a, I'm probably anchoring a little more of the Pollyanna continuum on here. <laughs> um, I'd like to believe that 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 productive narcissism and humility could coexist. And I think so many people think of humility as sort of that, oh no, no, everybody, I'm here for everybody. I'm serving, serving, serving. And I don't think so. I think great humility comes from that, that position of success. You can have pride in what you do and pride in others. You can celebrate others' accomplishments because you know you're so, like it doesn't diminish you. Um, I think there are some good aspects of that, of humility that we, that we do need to keep reinforcing, but at the same time, not sort of tilt as you were describing, not tilt so far that we lose the, the other, that gravitas and that, that, that presence. Um, and the last, the last thing I'll say is it's one of uh, a cultural, cause I, again, I'm gonna end where I started. And that is the idea that, um, with humility, what we found in studies globally is that there's this difference between felt and expressed humility. So while the felt humility, you know, could be important for at least what I do, the work in multicultural environments, because you have to understand this, this complex environment that you don't. So, so a little bit of humility walking into a multicultural setting is a good thing because you kind of be able to say, okay, I might be brilliant in finance, accounting, whatever, but I'm not exactly sure how to do that here. So a little bit of humility goes a long way. The difference, what we're finding is that feeling humble about, I'm not sure how to do this here, I'm gonna to need to ask for some advice and expressing it are two different things. So what we're finding is that also, so as much as teaching the present, you know, the, the presence and the gravitas and the communication, as much as that's critical, it was also teaching our leaders how to, this is, this is threading a needle, how to appear humble without appearing weak. So appearing like that you, you really want to learn about the context in order to be effective without appearing like you're less than a leader. So if you ask for too much advice off the top, people will look at you and say, I'm not following. I'm not, you're not somebody who's going to lead me if I'm the one who has to tell you. So I thought that there's really an interesting variance around the world in terms of um, how one needs to, to display humility. And so uh, those were my, those are my brief comments. I, you know, certainly know everyone's here to, to listen to you, but I just don't want to, I want to make sure that we remember that, um, you know, that that expression might differ a little bit around the world.